Hey folks, Changing Reason here. Today I want to discuss the school bus crash that occurred in Chattanooga, Tennessee on Monday, November 21st. Not to be confused with the school bus crash that occurred in Nashville, Tennessee, just three days earlier. Anyway, there are so many things wrong with this story that it's difficult to know where to begin. So let's start with the official narrative, that is, the official narrative as of today. As we'll see shortly, key details of this event have a way of inexplicably changing. On Monday, November 21st, at approximately 3.15 p.m., a school bus loaded with 37 children from Woodmore Elementary School headed southbound on a narrow winding road, lost control, and began to roll, striking a power pole before wrapping itself around a tree. Six children were killed and 24 more were injured. The bus was driven by 24-year-old Jonathan e. Walker, who had only received his commercial driver's license in April of 2016, and had been in a previous accident in September while driving his school bus. In addition, it is being reported that Walker received several complaints from students and parents regarding his driving. Walker, who we are told was driving his bus well over the posted speed limit in the moments leading up to the crash, has been charged with multiple counts of vehicular homicide. So what's wrong with this story? Let's start with the low-hanging fruit. When this story initially broke, it was reported that 12 children had been killed. But within an hour or two, this figure was reduced to six, confirmed by the Chattanooga District Attorney's Office. By the following morning, the fatality count had changed again to five. We were told four students died at the scene and another passed away later in the hospital. And finally, a day or so later, it was reported that a sixth student died in the hospital. So it turns out the DA's office earlier inaccurate count turned out to be accurate after all. That's interesting, isn't it? The number of students taken to the hospital seems to fluctuate back and forth between 23 and 24, depending on the source. 23 children were transported to Erlanger Hospital for treatment. We do know that multiple children lost their lives, lives today in this tragic incident. It's noteworthy that the school bus crash in Nashville on November 18th also sent 23 kids to the hospital. Additionally, the total number of students on the bus has changed, too. Initially, the count was 35, a figure confirmed by Hamilton County Schools. Hamilton County Schools has confirmed there were 35 students on board that bus. All of those students attend Woodmore Elementary and are in grades kindergarten through fifth grade. Yet, at some point, this number was bumped up to 37, a figure confirmed by the Hamilton County Department of Education. I'm beginning to think more than a few people don't know what confirmed means. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. What's more, why would law enforcement and other responding agencies require this number to be confirmed by any party other than the units that were actually at the scene? Wouldn't they be the definitive source for this information? I mean, why would the Hamilton County Department of Education need to tell Chattanooga Fire Rescue how many kids they just pulled from the bus? People seem to be having trouble with the word winding, too. According to the police report, the bus was traveling down a, quote, narrow winding road, end quote. Here is Woodmore Elementary School. And here is Tally Road. The crash occurred right here, less than one mile from the school. I don't know about you, but I would hardly characterize this path as winding. Granted, it's not a perfectly straight line, but there certainly are no sharp curves either. However, in order to even begin to explain how the bus ended up where it ended up, we need to believe the bus was careening down an IndyCar road course and not coming out of a gentle 150 degree bend. And in apparent anticipation of observations like this, 
New details are beginning to emerge that indicate that perhaps the crash was deliberate, but we'll come back to that in a bit. There also seems to be confusion regarding the bus route. On November 22nd, the Times Free Press reported that the driver of the bus was on his regular route. However, as of November 24th, reports are claiming the school bus had not been traveling its designated route. Crash investigators are saying that the bus was not even supposed to be on Tally Road. According to Hamilton County Schools Transportation Supervisor Ben Coulter, the route for bus 366, Walker's bus, travels west of Tally Road. But in apparent conflict with these statements, the Times Free Press, also on November 22nd, quotes a woman named Alice Carruthers, indicating that she lives on Tally Road, near the site of the crash. According to Alice, quote, he does this all the time. He comes through here flying, end quote. Perhaps the confusion lies in the fact that Bus 366 also transported students to and from Brainerd High School. This schedule from the Hamilton County Department of Transportation's website indicates drop-offs at the intersections of Sunset Avenue and Tally Road and Montview Drive and Sweetbriar Avenue at 2.39 p.m. and 2.40 p.m. respectively. This route would clearly take Walker down this stretch of Tally Road. It's very peculiar that reporting on this story has so far failed to mention this very relevant piece of information. Have the high school students from this earlier route reported any issues with him? How was Walker's driving that afternoon, less than an hour before driving the very same bus, now carrying elementary school students, into a tree? The absence of such questions in media reports should be raising red flags for anyone paying attention. Okay, let's spend some time now looking at the scene of the crash itself. According to the arrest affidavit, quote, Mr. Walker lost control of the bus and swerved off of the roadway to the right, striking an elevated driveway and mailbox, then swerved to the left and began to overturn, striking a telephone pole and a tree, end quote. Now, as we can see from photos of the scene, the bus came to rest on its side, entirely off and several degrees beyond perpendicular to the road. So let's begin this discussion with a brief survey of the area. In this image, we are on Tally Road, looking south. This is the, quote, elevated driveway referenced in the affidavit, and this is the mailbox, which we'll be discussing in more detail later. After striking the mailbox, we are told the bus then veered to the left. Here is the telephone pole, and here is the tree. Note, this is 318 Tally Road, not 313, as originally reported. As we can see, the telephone pole and the tree are quite close to one another. In fact, if we measure this distance within Google Earth, we find it's roughly 25 feet. Also noteworthy is this bush, which is mere feet from the telephone pole. Now, Let's place these various elements into a simple 3D model in order to better visualize the scene. The driveway is here. The mailbox is here. Here is the telephone pole and the nearby bush. And finally, here is the tree. Let's also add the bus, which according to reports is a 2008 Thomas built model. Here is a photo of an identical bus in the Durham School Services fleet, also servicing Hamilton County Schools. This 90-passenger, flat-nosed, Type D school bus is approximately 40 feet long and weighs roughly 15 tons. Now, based on the final location and orientation of the bus, it must have been rolling from more or less this direction before it impacted the tree. This places the telephone pole and the nearby bush directly in the bus's path. However, the condition of the pole is curious. 
In this photo, we can see two things that just don't add up. First, the telephone pole appears to be broken in two locations. From the way the pole is leaning, it appears to have snapped at the base. And also here, many feet up. The top third or so of the pole is just hanging from the lines. Now, upon being struck by a vehicle, a utility pole generally snaps at or near the point of impact. But we do sometimes see the pole break well above the impact zone. We generally do not see both. Also curious is the nature of the upper break. Rather than the sort of splitting and folding we see in these examples, what we see here is a clean break. The pole is completely severed, as if cut. The second thing that strikes me is the fact that the bottom portion of the pole is still upright. We are told that the bus went into its roll before striking the pole. But if this were the case, then how could the pole still be partially upright, leaning against the power lines? The bus would have been acting as a giant rolling pin. How could the bus have traveled through the space occupied by the pole without flattening it to the ground in the direction of the bus's motion? It's simply not possible. We may be tempted to suggest, then, that the bus perhaps just grazed the pole, as opposed to striking it square on. If this were the case, we should still see evidence of a tremendous impact somewhere toward the very rear of the bus. But we find no such evidence on either the sides of the bus or on the roof. But perhaps authorities have it wrong. Maybe the bus hit the pole straight on and then went into the roll. But this cannot be the case for more than one reason. The visible damage to the front of the bus does not appear consistent with such an impact. While the area above the windshield, here, is visibly caved in, the grille and surrounding elements appear almost pushed outward, and there does not appear to be any damage to the bumper. But as is evident in this example, in a straight-on collision with a telephone pole, the bus's bumper would suffer the brunt of the impact. The damage we see here is very different. But even if we imagine the bus did strike the pole here, we are again left wondering how the telephone pole remained upright. Additionally, we would expect an impact on the passenger side front to have pivoted the bus somewhat to the left, swinging the rear end away from the road, which doesn't jibe with how the bus ultimately came to rest, with its rear end toward the road. And finally, in order for it to have hit the pole straight on, this 40-foot bus would have had to have then made a nearly right angle turn to the left, rolled over 90 degrees, and then come to a rest with the rear of the bus well off the road, all within the 25 or so feet between the pole and the tree, and done so without knocking the telephone pole flat to the ground. Such a scenario would require cartoon physics and is beyond the realm of serious consideration. In addition to the inexplicably upright utility pole, we have this apparently impervious bit of shrubbery. Seen here, post-crash, this bush, despite having been in the direct path of a rolling 15-ton bus, is unscathed. Also remarkably intact is the lawn itself. In not a single available photograph or piece of video is there any visible damage to the yard. Even the blanket of fallen leaves appears undisturbed. We would expect a sliding or rolling object the size of this bus to leave in its wake a distinct path of pitted turf and excavated soil. Yet we see nothing of the kind. It doesn't appear so much as a bicycle has been ridden through this yard. And let's look at the bus itself. There's not a speck of dirt anywhere to be seen. We should see clumps of debris jammed into the various nooks and crannies of the bus's exterior, but we see nothing, not a single leaf, twig, or blade of grass. In fact, beyond the actual structural damage itself, the surface of the bus is pristine. There's literally not even a scratch in the paint. 
In this photograph, we get a good look at the rear tires, which are spotless. The undercarriage is likewise absent of any visible dirt or debris. The position of these two branches we see here does not suggest a violent impact. Rather, it appears they were just rested there after the fact. Upon close inspection, this one looks cut, like a piece of firewood. And considering that a large number of injured and bloodied children were reportedly evacuated from the rear of the bus, one would expect at least a few bloody handprints or smears on the backs of these seats or around the frame of the door. But we see nothing. It's as clean as the day it rolled off the factory floor. But how can this be? We'll attempt to answer this question later. Now, let's take a look at the mailbox. Here it is again in our Google Street View image. And here's the mailbox post impact. So what we see is the post bent, not pulled from the ground, but bent downward at nearly 90 degrees. But somehow the box not only remained attached to the post, it suffered relatively minor damage. Think about this for a minute. The first thing to have made contact with the oncoming bus would be the box, not the pole. An impact with the force required to bend a metal post this way would have absolutely flattened the structurally much weaker box, or more likely, torn it from the post and sent it flying through the air. But instead we see this, some small dents along one edge. It looks more like it was hit with a hammer or other small blunt object a few times and there's no visible scraping or paint transferred from the bus. Does this damage seem at all consistent with a collision with a speeding school bus? No, it doesn't. Not in the slightest. Even the damage to the tree itself is suspect. Beyond a remarkably uniform loss of bark, there's no apparent structural damage to the trunk itself which, as we can see in this June 2014 image, is not even particularly large in circumference. We see some shallow superficial gouges, but nothing to indicate a collision with a 15-ton bus moving at a high enough speed to wrap itself around the trunk. In short, upon close examination, the crash scene fails to make any sense. How the bus came to rest, the odd state and position of the utility pole, the condition of the lawn, the lack of any dirt, blood, or debris or scratches on the bus, the nature of the damage to the mailbox, and the condition of the tree. Taken together, not only defy virtually every element of the story we're being told, but seem to defy common sense and natural laws. But let's hold that thought for now and take a look at some other details of this story. In this photo, two students are allegedly being treated for their injuries. It's being reported that these two students were treated here for nearly an hour. Now, the location we see here is well over 200 feet from the site of the crash. Specifically, we're looking at the corner of Tally Road and Sunset Avenue. It just so happens that this address, 4007 Sunset Avenue, is the residence of one Alice Carruthers, the witness we discussed earlier who explained to the Times Free Press that this bus speeds down the road all the time. Anyway, why were these children not immediately taken to the hospital? Photos from the scene show first responders everywhere. Why carry these kids 200 feet and treat them in someone's front yard for an hour? It's mind-boggling. In other cases, we have parents just showing up at the scene and walking off with their kids. This is difficult to understand. Were these children thoroughly examined? Were they questioned by police? After an accident of this nature, wouldn't it make a whole lot more sense to take all of the children to the hospital, just to be safe? 
But instead, it is reported that some children, quote, walked away clutching their parents' hands, looking dazed with cuts on their faces, end quote. Does that sound normal to you? Then we have Jonathan e. Walker's driving record. Well, Johnson e. Walker had a wreck in a school bus two months earlier. It's listed here in his driving record. I just got a copy of it from the state of Tennessee. On September 20th, Walker was driving a school bus on Sylvan Lane in Chattanooga. That's when, according to the police report, he sideswiped a car, a Kia Soul, going in the opposite direction. Uh, here's a picture of the map that uh, I found that the officer did. This happened at a blind curve, it says, where he failed to yield um, on September 20th. Now, it is not clear from this report if there were children on the bus. The report says there were no children in the front row, so we don't know if there were kids on the bus at that time. Walker worked for a contract a transportation company called Durham School Services. I don't know enough about criteria required in order to secure and maintain a commercial driver's license to say for sure, but I suspect the cited September 20th accident would have been more than enough to have his CDL suspended, at least temporarily. But this is not what I find most interesting about this previous accident. According to the police report, the incident occurred Tuesday, September 20th, right here on Sylvan Drive. The time of the incident is listed as 1440 or 240 p.m. For those of you paying close attention, this time should sound familiar. As you'll recall, according to Hamilton County Schools bus schedule, bus 366 Walker's bus should be dropping off students from Brainerd High School, which is located here, at the corner of Sunset Avenue and Tally Road at 2.39 p.m. and at the corner of Montview Drive and Sweetbriar Avenue at 2.40 p.m. So what was he doing all the way up here at that time? What's more? According to the report, Walker was heading in this direction on Sylvan Drive at the time of the accident, away from his designated 2.40 p.m. stops. So it's not as if he was just running late that day. He was driving in entirely the wrong direction. But the strikes against Jonathan e. Walker don't end there. Apparently, students, parents, and even the school principal have been complaining about him since the school year began. On November 2nd, a school official personally observed a slew of disturbing behavior from Walker, including Walker telling the students on the bus that he, quote, did not care about them, end quote. Upon hearing of this incident, the school district's transportation supervisor indicated that the issue would be addressed with Walker. Obviously, nothing came of this. Just two weeks later, on November 16th, six students allegedly complained that Walker was, quote, swerving and purposely trying to cause them to fall, end quote. One student in a written complaint claimed that Walker, quote, drives fast and that it, quote, feels like the bus is going to flip over. He makes people go seat to seat back and forth. When someone is in the aisle, he stops the bus and makes people hit their heads, end quote. Another student complained in writing that, quote, the bus driver was doing sharp turns and it made me fly over to the next seat. We need seat belts. End quote. Even Woodmore Elementary School principal Brenda Cothran expressed concern Walker was, quote, driving way too fast when he pulled out of our school, end quote. And here's Jasmine Mateen, mother of two children who were injured in the crash and one child that was killed. Uh, they were at the school bus every morning, every afternoon. Every day they come home, they're complaining about the school bus. Since August, the first day of school. I've been calling, complaining about this bus driver since August. I done called the Board of Education. 
Anacostal School, Anacostal Durham, Durham. I done wrote a letter to the school. I done wrote a letter to the bus driver. The principal read the letter to the bus driver two weeks ago when I wrote the letter. He, she read it to the bus driver out loud in front of all the kids. And after she got done with the letter, he said, so, I'll do it again. It was about him slamming on brakes on purpose, making all the kids hit their heads. What is he drinks every day on the bus. Oh my God. Now, are your kids telling you yes. That? He's always cussing at them. He's always speeding. We have now entered the realm of absurdity. We are to believe that this mother has been complaining about this driver to anyone who will listen since August, since the very first day of school, complaining that he drinks on the bus, cusses at the students, drives recklessly, and generally seems to be torturing his young passengers. Yet Walker remained in his position. And why Mateen would continue to put her kids on this bus day after day is also a question worth asking. We are also to believe the school principal just two weeks prior to the accident, actually read a complaint letter written by Mrs. Mateen out loud to Walker, in front of all the students on his bus, no less, and Walker's response was that he would defiantly continue doing what he was doing, yet Walker remained in his position. We are to believe that despite the fact that complaints about Walker's driving and behavior were already on record, he caused an accident on September 20 while driving his bus, yet Walker remained in his position. All of this is impossible to believe. There is no way, in this world or the next, that even a fraction of the types of behavior being attributed to Jonathan Walker would be allowed to continue without consequences. Regardless of how incompetent no school district would allow someone like this to continue driving a school bus, if for no reason other than liability. The school would not have allowed him on the property, let alone behind the wheel of a bus. And the company managing the bus fleet, Durham School Services, a national firm, would have fired him without a second thought long, long before things could escalate to this level. And then there's this gem. He was speeding, coming around the curb. He was, he was drinking. He asked them, was they ready to die? Jerked the steering wheel. The bus flipped over twice, ran through a light pole, smacked two trees, and went through that. He asked the kids, quote, are you ready to die, end quote, and then jerked the wheel. Well, there you have it, everyone. Jonathan Walker did this on purpose. He's a lunatic. Are you kidding me? I don't know what's more ridiculous, Mrs. Mateen's story or her performance. And make no mistake, this is a performance. She is acting and doing it badly. This is all a preposterous fiction, every last word of it. There was no bus crash, no kids were hurt, and there is no sadistic bus driver. This was a hoax, an emergency services drill played out and reported as a real event. So how did they do it? We may never know for sure, but I do have an idea. Let's take another look at the bus. From the moment I was able to get a good look at the extent and nature of the damage, my gut was pointing me away from any sort of impact with a utility pole, a tree, or anything else. No, this wasn't an impact. This bus looks crushed. So I did some searching and came across this video of a nearly identical bus being demolished at a scrapyard.
And let's pause this right here and compare it to our bus. Look at how the frame is bowed upward in both cases. Look at how the mullions between the windows are slanted backward here, yet remain more or less vertical here. And look at how the grill appears to be pushed forward in relation to the backward sloping windshield. The similarities here are more than just uncanny. I believe our bus was similarly crushed, either before or upon its arrival at 318 Tally Road. It was then positioned on its side, against the tree, which had likely been prepped in advance, having been pushed or pulled over slightly to expose its roots, with sections of bark removed in designated areas. This scenario explains why the bus is so damned clean, and why the lawn remained relatively undisturbed. It also explains something I found peculiar about at least one of the photos from the scene. This image, released by the Chattanooga Fire Department, is unique in that it is the only one I've come across taken from this vantage point, which provides a more or less straight-on view of the roof of the bus. The other handful of photos, taken during the supposed emergency response and also released by the Chattanooga Fire Department, were all taken from nearly the same location much farther to the left, closer to the rear of the bus. Anyway, notice the difference in character between the shadows here and the shadows here. See how the shadow of the leafy branch right here is unnaturally cut off at the left. Shadows just don't work that way. There's been some funny business. I suspect the actual damage to the bus, caused by crushing the roof, didn't look quite right once the bus was positioned against the tree, so this image, and perhaps others, was digitally retouched, photoshopped if you will, before being released. This may also explain why so few images of the wreck were released to the public, and why the bus was later transported with a large tarp draped over the worst of the damage. It should be noted here that along with the bus, the tree itself was removed the very next day. Perhaps the utility pole was an afterthought. Someone may have realized the bus could not have landed against the tree without colliding with the pole on its way. The brake toward the top of the pole was likely done first, using a chainsaw, before the rest of the pole was pushed or pulled over at its base. This way, the illusion of an impact was created without actually disrupting electrical service to the neighborhood. And while we do have witnesses, like this one referencing a loss of power, as I'm sure she had been instructed, This Something's woman lives around the corner from where the accident happened. I just heard a big boom. I was watching TV and all the power went out. We have others who very conspicuously fail to mention anything about a power outage, like Ed Wilson, who explains, quote, We were watching TV, and we heard this tremendously loud crash, so of course we went to the door to check. I could tell right away that it was bad, very bad. So I immediately went back into the house to call 911, end quote. Losing power immediately upon hearing a tremendous crash is a pretty key detail to leave out. Mary Smith, who we are told lives at 318 Tally Road, explained, quote, There was a loud bang. All I could see was dust. End quote. Again, no mention of a loss of power. I'd like to also point out that I have yet to find a photo that clearly shows the damaged utility pole, which, like the tree, was removed the very next day. In photos such as this one, we are looking at a brand new pole. Clearly, considering the immediate removal of the utility pole and the tree, and the tarp-covered damage to the bus, a concerted effort was made to keep these key elements safe from unwanted scrutiny. 
For added effect, we have the part about the bus hitting the mailbox, to which the damage was apparently hastily staged, with little regard for how it would have actually fared against a speeding vehicle of this size. As already noted, a couple of carefully framed and digitally manipulated photographs of the wreckage were released on cue by the Chattanooga Fire Department so the media would have something to present. And all subsequent video and still images from the scene have been strictly controlled, all similarly tight, providing very little context and revealing as little detail as possible. The appropriate neighborhood residents would have been given payment of some kind in exchange for signatures on non-disclosure agreements. Other individuals, assuming they actually live nearby, but who knows, were even allowed speaking parts in front of the camera. I'm sure it was great fun. There was another girl that eventually came and she stood down by me and the two of us were there with him for a little while. And, and as people were scattering around and more uh, EMTs were coming around and ambulances and things like that, I was saying, over here, you know, and you know, where do you start in a situation like that? So they uh, finally took him, but I, I have a feeling he probably didn't make it. Other individuals were contracted to play the roles of grieving parents and relatives. Ask any actor and they'll tell you that a convincing portrayal of grief is among the trade's most difficult demands. This could not be more evident here. Yeah, I'm doing what I thought I'd be doing, but my baby laying in a cold freezer. Her mouth was open like this, like she was screaming. When we took him to see his father, you know, I just always could look back at in the back seat. <laughs> see him, you know, the, t the, little, the time that I spent with him, you know, I could just, mm -hmm. you know, see him, how playful and how. I know my baby, he rides the front of the bus. And when they told me that they started from the back of the bus, I knew that my baby don't ride the back of the bus. I don't wish that on nobody. Nobody. For the family of Woodmore Elementary student Cardasia Jones, it's even worse. I thought it was a nightmare, you know, to wake me up, you know. I mean, then to get there and sit there that long a time and they don't tell you anything. I mean, I mean, it was just, it was wild, it was unreal. They're smiling, man. She always smiling. Always smiling. Always smiling, man. No, she ain't having a smile right now, huh? so we good. We gonna be all right. Among those victims, there's 10-year-old Zayanna Harris. Tonight, WREG's Michael Quander spoke with her stepfather who says, they are heartbroken. Well, Alex in April, it wasn't good, not good at all. In fact, it was hard for him to make it through our interview the whole time, fighting back tears. Man, it's painful. It's painful right now talking about it. You see it when you see it, you, you, you see the sweetness in the car. You'll, wanna, you'll be like, look, look, she cute. This angel just gone. She, you know, she was young, but life hadn't even really begun. She gone. She gone. Obviously, the first responders on the scene, the various associated agencies, and key medical personnel are participating in the drill as well. This is just part of the job for them, as is locking down the area. Police didn't merely block off a couple of intersections to redirect traffic. As we can see, they lined up along Tally Road as far as the eye can see in both directions. Clearly, their primary responsibility was to keep unauthorized eyes and cameras from getting anywhere near the staged wreckage. 
Their job was not to simply keep cars away, but anyone who might come strolling through the yards on foot to take a peek or a picture. Elements of the media are necessarily either directly participating in the deception or, at best, indirectly permitting it by merely parroting secondary sources or official statements, instead of conducting any real investigations of their own. She said the two kids, Josh, who survived the accident, told her that the driver said to the busload of kids just before the accident, is everyone here ready to die? Is everyone here ready to die? There was, and if that is true, there was something going on on that bus that was, that was very, very wrong, and investigators will be taking a look at that as well. A level of heartbreak um, unimaginable. Mark Strassman there in Chattanooga. Mark, we, we... You'll know there was absolutely no live coverage that evening from anywhere near the actual site of the crash, and no local news helicopters were deployed to provide aerial footage. However, because nothing actually occurred, with all the details existing exclusively on a script, mistakes can happen. Someone might misread something here or release a detail ahead of schedule there. This is how the district attorney's office confirmed six dead when only five kids had supposedly died at that point. Or how initial reports had a fatality count of 12. Where did that number come from anyway? Well, I don't think it's a coincidence that, as you'll see in this NBC clip released two days after the crash, that of the 24 students taken to the hospital, 12 remained there for further treatment. This morning, 12 of the children from the bus accident remain here in the hospital. Six of them are in intensive care. Now, because of their young age and because some of them lost brothers and sisters and close friends, their parents and doctors have decided it's still too early to tell them not everyone survived the accident. Or how grieving mother number one, Jasmine Mateen, with the particularly familiar last name, seems to go off script blathering details about the event that are either demonstrably false or unconfirmed by authorities. I said, now y'all doing what y'all supposed to have been doing. Now that it's too late. Now that it's six kids there. Yeah, doing what y'all supposed to be doing, but my baby laying in a cold freezer. He was speeding, coming around the curb. He was, he was drinking. He asked them, was they ready to die? Jerked the steering wheel. The bus flipped over twice, ran through a light pole, smacked two trees, and went through that. Walker was drinking. The reported results of his blood test say otherwise. The bus flipped over twice and hit a light post and two trees? No, it didn't. Six dead? At the time of this interview, the fatality count was only five. As a side note, I can't help but point out the combination of numbers associated with this event. Jonathan Walker is 24 years old. 24 students were taken to the hospital, 12 of which remained there with six in critical condition and six in stable condition. There were six fatalities, and the bus number was 366. And also in this script are the far-fetched details of John Thinney Walker's stint as a demented, sadistic school bus driver, hell-bent on terrorizing defenseless little children, unchecked by a tragically inept public school bureaucracy, if only someone had heeded the warning signs, all of this could have been avoided. And seatbelts. Seatbelts would have helped too. Despite reports that a black box and one or more cameras were recovered from the bus, the National Transportation Safety Board is now saying it could take a year or more to determine the cause of the crash. Just so we're clear, that's 12 to 18 months for a team of federal transportation experts to figure out how a bus hit a tree.
And that's that. This event, like so many others, having served its purpose, will simply vanish down the memory hole. To those of you watching this video who are unfamiliar with or resistant to the concept of staged events, this is a textbook example of one. This is how it's done, and how it's done all the time. To those of you who thought staged events were limited to terrorist attacks and mass shootings, this hopefully opens your eyes a bit wider. Faked events are not the exception. They are the norm. And while the agencies and agendas may vary from one to the next, taken together, these hoaxes serve to construct an entirely fictional world for the TV audiences. A world where terrorists and maniacs lurk around every corner, even behind the wheel of your child's school bus. You are not safe. You are not secure. You cannot trust anyone anymore. You and your loved ones are always in danger. A terrorized population is easy to control. And this is how it's done to us. While conducting the research for this video, I came across a bizarre anomaly within Google Earth and Google Maps. This 200-foot section of Tally Road, starting from the intersection at Midwood Drive and ending at the precise location of the crash scene, contains no Street View images. None. Not even old ones. These missing images would have provided ideal, unobstructed views of the tree and front yard. Just what are the odds of a crash occurring on this tiny stretch of road, one of only three such sections within miles in any direction that contain no street view images? Pretty long odds, I imagine. But not nearly as long as the odds of all three of these sections of road being located near significant sites related to this story. The second is a small stretch of Woodmore Lane, just a stone's throw south of Woodmore Elementary School. The third is a section of Sylvan Drive, just a few hundred feet up the road from the location of Jonathan Walker's supposed September 20th accident. I'm not sure what exactly to make of this, but I know for certain this cannot be a coincidence. Could it be that in the early planning stages of this event, these three locations were chosen as potential sites to stage the bus crash? Per request, perhaps directly from the NTSB, Google removed the Street View images from the respective stretches of roadway. And though ultimately the Tally Road location was chosen, the Street View images have yet to be reactivated at the other two sites. And at some point, someone pegged Sylvan Drive as the location of Walker's fictional September 20th accident. This is speculation, of course, but I think I'm on the right track here. Any way you slice it, though, this appears to be solid evidence of complicity on the part of Google. 